uh, Willem Deckham from uh, Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. And he will have a talk about the eel stock. Is it slowly drying up? Please. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, I'm delighted to give a talk here. I've been working in Sweden for seven years now. And I haven't been given that many talks within Sweden. Um, I'm a mathematical biologist and my education has been on mathematical models, estimation problems in statistics and things like that. And yet, here you find a copy of a historical cookbook um, giving a recipe of how to dry your eel. And no, this is not just a funny picture. It really has a very high importance because it signals that the eel was very abundant. And if you read the recipe, you will find that it is very restricted. It just says, do the next step. And it doesn't give details how to do it, because everybody in Europe knew what an eel was, and everybody had access to an eel. Well, think about when you saw your last eel. Um, but I will would like to start with another fish, and I w won't name the fish because I don't need the name. That's a fish that spawns in the sea, produces eggs and larvae, and the, the larvae migrate towards the freshwater uh, or the coastal area. And they are fished both by recreational fishermen and commercial fishermen, and there are other impacts over there. And it is the young stage that migrates into coastal waters or the freshwater. And this species is distribu distributed approximately in this area. I'm exaggerating a bit, but that doesn't matter. You find that fish, the flounder, everywhere. But if you find flounder in Sweden, it spawns in front of the Swedish coast. If you find it in England, it spawns in front of the English coast. If you find it in northern Italy, it spawns just in front of the Italian coast. But I was not going to talk about flounder, I was going to talk about eels. And eels deviate in two ways. The spawning place is very far away, and it is just one single stock. Um, I'm not an expert in genetics, so I hardly understand the word of it, so I'm very happy of the previous spe speaker covering that. But I would like to give you one extra detail. The whole stock in Europe is extremely uniform. It's not just the Baltic, it's the whole stock that's very uniform. And there are indications that the within-season genetic variation is bigger than the spatial variation. So the first wave of young eels coming towards the continent are very related between themselves, more than three, three months later. But the three months later ones, again, are very related to each other. So it seems that we are having waves of individual families coming in. And actually the Japanese, now I'm talking about Japanese eel, a different species, have found full brothers and sisters all over the whole continent, the whole uh, island of, of Japan. Um, be aware of the consequences for management. We are somewhere there and we have an eel fishery we have an eel management in Sweden, and we do manage our stock. But that has consequences for the spawning place, and by the time they spawn, those animals arrive in Egypt. What we do affects Egypt. And the other way around, what the Egyptians do to their eel stock affects our stock within one generation. A very unusual problem in fisheries management. Um, well, just to show you some eels. I won't have that many eels in my presentation. And the CD cover in the middle is a hard rock band from Texas. I don't know why they are called the eels, but they have. And I've never heard the music. So here it stops. Um, a historical picture and a somewhat more recent picture taken at the same place. And this is in the Netherlands, I'm Dutch. This is a situation, this is young eels in front of the sluices in the Netherlands trying to 
come into fresh water. That happened, well, this is a picture from April 1958. I was only two years old at that date. But that lasted until 1980. And I've seen this in my youth. I was fishing illegally, and I didn't want to see eels, stupid animals. Um, but they were clouding the whole view you had on the fish you wanted to see and the fish you wanted to, to catch. Um, I remember one time we tried to fish them out, and we have taken kilos of young eels out of the water, and it didn't make any change. This is a photograph from 1991, because I could find a photograph from 1991. If I would make a photograph now, the likelihood of seeing any eel is very low, and two eels is simply out of the question. And I'm now making quite a large step towards the, what made this happen. And I'm going back to the mid-1800s until the mid-1900s. And in the mid-1800s, there is a French publication of a fishing officer who says, we are blocking all our rivers, we are draining all our marshes. No wonder the migratory fish can't come in anymore. And he actually su su uh, suggests to build a ladder over there. I'm not quite sure what the drawing is, whether this is something he did build, or just the idea he was promoting. And this is a, well, it looks like a very old photograph, but it, it isn't that very old. Um, the restructuring of the Swedish rivers for logging, for um, transporting wood, that restructured all the rivers in a quite short period. We have restructured all the waterways in Europe. And here, a bit more better example from Sweden. This is the river Jungan in 1950. And this is the river Jungan. It's almost the same place, two years later. And as you can see, an open river with quite unstructured coastlines have been transformed into something that's absolutely impossible for any fish. And of course, you can make a fish pass over there. Well, there is a story about that, but I won't go into the details. So it should not um, this one, surprise us that much that already by 1865, we find statements like this, and this is a French statement, so I translated it for you, that the eel stock was in decline, was actually not just a bit in decline, but really was at a loss. While it was an important food item. There were many recipes all over Europe saying this is an important food item and you can easily store it. Dry the eel and you, you have good food. Um, and in the mid-1800s, the French realized that they were losing not only eel, but several migratory species. And to handle that, they started an active policy. It started in 1850, and then there is uh, some political development in France. And they s built a fish hatchery, and that's built in Hunange, that's very close to Basel, on the River Rhine. Um, actually, the hills you can see there in the background, that is Germany, so it is really very close to the border. That is the first fish hatchery in the world. And the bottom photograph is a modern photograph. The building still exists. And they were growing a lot of different species there. And don't think this was a small hatchery. This was in the millions. And most often, people state that it is the artificial reproduction developed in the 1840s. And a very dominant uh, director of the institute who made a success. But I think there's another factor, and that's the technical development. If I can grow millions of young fish, but I can't transport them, I'm having a big problem. And actually, the artificial reproduction had been done by the Germans before, but there was no steam train at that time. So that was the end point. Um, didn't mention any species for the fish hatchery. 
And again, this is a very nice quote saying, we are successful in reproducing perch and tench. So without any doubt, it will also be applicable to salmon and eel. In 1852, salmon had not been reproduced yet. And eel had not been reproduced artificially yet. Um, well, you know about salmon reproduction. I don't have to explain you that. In 1852, they started trying to reproduce eel, and they failed. Nowadays, we can, but don't think that it's just um, an eel you mature, and then they, they will spawn, and there the whole system works. It is hormone injections, um, but it works, and you can produce eggs, and you can produce larvae, but there the story stops. We don't know what to feed the larvae. And yes, the Japanese have done some very odd work, and they can feed a couple of larvae. But it's a couple of, it's not millions. And still, we fail there completely. What you see here is what's nowadays called eel culture, but actually it is wild eel grown indoors. It's still wild eel. We can't reproduce them. Um, 1850, the start of artificial reproduction. Soon people tried the eel, and it failed. So what's the next step? Well, the logical step is let's turn to nature and find out why we fail. And if I talk about natural reproduction of the eel, the name and the face that probably come to your mind is Johanna Schmidt, who sailed the world in the research vessel Margrethe. He inherited a lot of money from his aunt, Margrethe, and built a ship himself. And he fished for plankton all over the Atlantic Ocean, and eventually came with this map where he indicates that he finds 60 millimeter larvae over there, that he finds 45 millimeter larvae over there, etc., etc., until the smallest larvae are found over there. So what he claims is smallest larvae over there, that must be the place of the reproduction. But let's be honest, he has never found any reproducing eel. And up to today, no one has. Yeah, for the Japanese eel, one dubious case. Um, we don't know where they reproduce. And to add a little detail, that inner area is as large as the European Union. So it is still a very large search area. Um, but Johannes Schmidt was not on his own, and I would like to introduce a few of the others. Sierski was a student from Vienna, he was an Austrian, and he studied in Trieste. Trieste is now um, on the border between Italy and, what is it, Slovenia. Um, it is Italian, but at that time it was an Austrian city. And he studied there, and he found the female reproductive organs. And a few years later, another student from Vienna, also going to Trieste and finding the male reproductive organs. Sierski is quite known for it. Freud is not. He got frustrated for some reason. He left Trieste, went back to Vienna, and became a psychiatrist over there. Um, and then another step, Grassi and Calandruccio, they were also in, northern, in, 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 in the same area. They were Italian, they were not uh, Austrian. And what they found out was that a strange fish found in the ocean actually turned out to be the larvae of the eel, the leptocephalus. They grew it into a small eel. They are not very famous for that fact, because they started fighting each other. Um, Grassi was an arrogant jerk, and Calandruccio was a simple sod, and their characters didn't combine. And Calandruccio did all the work, and Grassi did all the writing, and it ended up that at the end of his life, Grassi was pub publishing and republishing and leaving out the name of Calandruccio, and Calandruccio went back to the countryside in his private house and eventually committed suicide. Um, but what I recently found out, they have some 
um, recognition for their effect, is that there is even another one, a Frenchman from Brittany, who had found out exactly the same 11 years before, but he never published it. And when Grassi and Calandruccio published their finding, it was another Frenchman saying, but we have done this before. But if you don't publish, no one will recognize you. Um, 1874, 1887, 1886, 1897, Schmidt, 1906. And I refer to 1906 since he came to his conclusions in 1906, then he had to wait for his aunt to die. Then there was the First World War, and eventually in 1922 he published the fact. Um, this is a period of major breakthroughs on the natural reproduction. But since then, we haven't made much progress. And even the recent publications make little steps. But the real breakthrough is still missing. The eel stock is in decline. We want to reproduce them artificially, but that fails. Therefore, we go to nature to find out how they reproduce, but we haven't found out. And then there's yet another option, and that's called restocking. You go somewhere where there are a lot of young eels, France, tip of England. You catch them over there, put them in a sack or in a box, transport them to somewhere else, and then you release them. Um, this is a photograph from the early 19, from the late uh, 1800s. This is the early 1900s. Well, this could be today. We still do it, and almost nothing has been changed. The wooden box is now a, a foam box, but that's probably the only change we ever made. And this is a very complex story, and I won't go into the details except that I show you that we start with a transport mechanism here that is quite limited. And then there's a steam train that's already a bit more complex, a ferry across the North Sea, and finally um, an airplane. But I also would like to say this is a French nobleman. This is a Prussian officer. This is a Jew, and this is a communist. And all those backgrounds are, have been relevant for the development. Um, okay, time trend, and I'm only showing after the Second World War, since anything done before was so little, you won't see it in this graph. Um, well, here's the Second World War, and just the Dutch starting up here, that's definitely a, a, a follow-up of the Second World War. Then the Poles come in, in blue, um, with their airplane, fly over Germany. You don't want to cross Germany after the Second World War. Um, there's a little dip here, because the Japanese come in. If you can fly from France to Poland, you can also fly from France to Japan. But they le soon left, and up to 1980. 1980 is the last year that the picture I showed of very abundant young eels occurred. And since that time, the abundance of the eel declined very rapidly, of the young eels, and so did the restocking. Um, Sweden is the dark yellow here. Sweden is, if you have a, a steamboat from England, is too far away. Sweden could have joined in using an airplane after the Second World War but not being involved in the Second World War and not having a relation to the communist countries. They simply didn't. So effectively, Sweden is a very late participant in this movement. Two questions. The restocking is being questioned over and over again. Does it work? People have said, you can't transport them alive. Well, you can. And they won't grow. Well, they do. And they won't mature, but they do. So there have been a long train of oppositions, but none of them was true. And yet, at the bottom line, what I say is, did it truly affect the stock? No, it didn't. And I will show you that in the next graph. This is a 
time trend from 1950, the starting point of our good data up till the present, and I didn't fill in the last years, but that's not really relevant. Fishery is someone taking a fish from the wild and putting it on land, full stop. Restocking is someone taking a fish from the wild, bringing it somewhere else, releasing it again, and then afterwards, when it has grown, fishing it again. So that is human intervention. It's not a natural stock, but it is in outdoor waters. And aquaculture is a fish taken from the wild, never released again. It's grown indoors. Um, the reason for saying restocking hasn't been that successful, note that the margin here is rather small. Yes, of course, it has affected the stock and it has affected the fishery, but it's simply not a dominant factor. And note that the fishery has been in decline since the mid-1960s. This is a revival after the war. Before the war, it was sky high. We have been a declining, seen a declining stock throughout the last century. Um, and the average decline since the mid-1960s is 5% per year. Second graph, that was the fishery. This is the young eel coming from the ocean, migrating to our waters. And the individual data series are stations all around Europe. It includes Italy, Spain, England, France, the Netherlands, Sweden. Um, and we split them into the North Sea and elsewhere because there's an impression that the North Sea does some things a bit different. Um, but if you look very, look very carefully, it is just this hump that suddenly makes the North Sea drop down. And there are two reasons for that. Um, one is this one. That's the Ems in Germany. And the Germans were not allowed to import eels from France after the Second World War. So they fished their river like hell and got much more out of it than anyone else. But in 1965, they were allowed to import a political decision after the Second World War, nothing more than that. And suddenly it drops, and when the stock starts to decline, the Germans give up very rapidly, simply because there's no need for them to fish that hard anymore. The second one is just me, me in person. All this fishery was done to collect a lot of eels. So if the catches were low, one would stop fishing, and you would have no low observations. When I came in office in 1985, I said, I do want to know the low observations. So I changed the whole setup of the registration process, and suddenly there is a lot of more of low observations. Um, that's how you take your measurements. Um, the point for showing this is in 1980, until 1980, it was more or less stable. There was no general trend. Then from 1980 onwards, it goes down by 15% per year. Note that I'm on a logarithmic axis. Otherwise, I couldn't show you the end. It would be all very close to zero. In 2009, an eel protection plan was adopted by the European Union. In 2009, the first eels were protected. Well, they still have to cross the ocean, and they have to spawn there, and then the youngsters have to come back. And lo and behold, it goes up. Exactly the time you would expect a change after the implementation of a protection plan. Summarizing my story so far, Artificial reproduction didn't work. Natural reproduction has never been identified. Restocking worked, but it wasn't that much. And it, at the end, in 1998, we finally made ICs write an advice and say this stock is in very bad state. And then the EU followed. Um, this is quite a change. This is supporting the fishery. That's in support of the fishery. That is it. Oh. That was the wrong. 
that's in support of the fishery, and then suddenly you have to write down the eel stock is in very bad st state, and you have to reduce your fisheries. So there was a, a culture change among us scientists. A few photographs of fishermen all around Europe. I won't go in any detail. Um, I could have shown you water management works, or cormorants, or any of the other impacts on the eel stock. The issue here is these are just three guys fishing together. And if you want to reach them, you have to go to them and you have to visit their local river. And sometimes the rivers are very, very small. And to, to talk to three fishermen, well, there are 10,000 eel fishermen across Europe. If I have to handle them by groups of one or two or three at a time, it will take me years be before I've ever spoken to all of them. Well, they are the ones truly affecting the fishery. And as a consequence, we need to study who takes action. And what I'm first giving is the historical setup. And the historical management structure for the eel was rather simple. There was no management structure. This is a French fisherman. These are from Italy, uh, Ireland, French, Swedish. They all fish for the same fish. They all use more or less the same gear. They share the market and they never talk to each other. Never ever do they meet. They talk almost the same jargon, but they, they don't communicate. Uh, and even stronger, here is a Swedish fisherman and here is a Swedish hydropower station. They talk exactly the same language. They live very close to each other. They affect the same fish. They didn't talk. So in the early 2000s, EU realized they had to do something. And in the eyes of the EU, this was a fisheries management problem. And, well, EU has handled fisheries management problems and has handled lots of fisheries management problems. So let's apply a standard approach. A closed season, a minimum legal size, a quota, etc., etc. Um, to make a long story short, that didn't work. And the reason is that these guys don't communicate to the European Commission. They hardly know what it is. But the other way around, the European Commission doesn't know the, these fishermen. And they have no understanding of what, what they are doing. The distance between the top international level and the actual people in the field is by far too great. Um, that was in the early 2000s, and the EU was really stuck. And then there was a lucky incident in that the Canadians asked me to give a keynote speech for one of their eel symposia. I think it was the first eel symposium. And the, well, I accepted the invitation, but then there was a hidden message to me, kick our managers in their ass. Okay, there you are as a middle-aged scientist and you have to kick foreign managers in their ass. So I didn't know what to do. And what I did instead was I focused on the European situation in theoretical terms and explained that to the Canadians. And that was read by the European Commission and that suddenly they saw a way forward. And the, the proposal was as follows. You give up on management measures at the top level. You just set the goal. We will we want to achieve this, but you don't say how to do it. Then you have a middle le level of national management plans that have an obligatory goal. They can't choose their own goal, but they can choose their own implementation, how to make it happen. And in turn, these national governments, having a national management plan, they impose restrictive measures in the field. So it is a stepwise procedure. Well, that's what actually happened. 2007 was the political decision setting the goal. 2008, the planning. 2009, the implementation. 
that's uh, top down. And then at the same time, there's in 2009, the monitoring starts. 2012, after three years, the assessments, the first assessments being made. In 2013, the political post evaluation at the international level. Downward worked. In five years' time, we made all of Europe starting making plans and implementing them. Wherever you go in Europe, if you go to the river mouth, you will find people working on eel at the moment. So we broke and stand still of 150 years and really made people move forward. And additionally, the information did come up to that level. So we are talking about a success story here. But at the top level, it didn't work. The scientific advice is still based on the old approach of we want full overview. And they still have the trouble that they don't have the full overview and they will never get it. Um, this was what was called a distributed control. You let people in the field do their own work and you organize steps in between. And the traditional top-down management, we want full overview first before we take any action, is still blocking our way forward. Um, I said 2012, the first assessment, 2015 was the second, that's the most recent. And here I'm showing a map of Europe. Um, I will briefly go into the overview, I won't go into the details. This is the biomass of mature eels leaving the continent, estimated by the different countries. And in green is what actually escapes at this moment. And as you can see, Sweden is one of the major players. In orange is the number of eels that are there, but they are killed before they get mature and can escape. So it is an option you had, but you didn't make it. But the option is there. And in red is what according to standard indicators, is needed to recover the stock. So that gives, you can't do it now, there are not, not enough eels to do it now, but in the long term you will have to do it. Um, and the weeping faces are all the countries that did not report. Algeria, that's a desert. Um, Egypt, the River Nile, has a huge eel stock, but I can understand. And I even included Syria. They do have an eel stock, but Syria has other priorities. And now turning to the, towards the Baltic. Um, in the Baltic, the situation is slightly more complex because the eels that leave England can go to the Sargasso Sea immediately. But the eels that leave from anywhere here inside the Baltic, they will come to the Swedish and the Danish coast and they are fished over there. And actually why the Swedish impact, the Swedish estimate is that high is be because we included all those eels in our estimate. We considered Sweden to be the whole Baltic. And of course that's not correct. Um, I'm not blaming anyone but myself. That's what we did but it's over-optimistic. At the same time, the polls report that they are underachieving, but they have not even taken into account that Sweden is fishing their eels. It is just their national estimate. Sweden did the best we could, not on the west coast, and Denmark simply made no assessment. They didn't report, and they come away with that. So it's not that positive at all. Um, we have a problem. <coughs> we have a way forward. We have broken the standstill of 150 years. And nevertheless, we're not making the right progress. And to analyze that, I will show you a bit of the results from a recent study I made 
on the sociology of the uh, decision processes. And I will explain them by three very simple settings. The first one, if you have many countries in eel management, involved in eel management, and you have fishermen, and recreational fishermen, and water managers, and hydropower people, and they have all their own objectives, and they don't cooperate, and they don't know how to handle the different issues, you end up in a situation which is called awkward drifting, and it is essentially nothing more than a very bad endpoint nobody wanted to have. There's nobody saying, I want to end in a, in a complete chaos. But that's what happened. Secondly, utopia. We now agree that eel needs protection. But we don't know how to do it. And we still have multiple players. And they all dream of one day the eel stock will recover. But actually nobody is taking adequate action. So it is a dream that can last forever. It will never be fulfilled. And finally, um, what the EU regulation, the, EU, the European EU protection plan wanted to achieve was we agree on the objectives. We focus on the certainties. If you want to protect your EU, you know how to do it. There's no uncertainty there. There might be an uncertainty in the Sargasso Sea, but that's somewhere else. But there are still multiple players and they don't really cooperate very well. The countries simply don't cooperate. Look at in the Baltic. Half the countries are not reporting. The missing element is someone orchestrating. And for that you need scientific advice and you need the European Commission. And you need someone taking the lead and saying, okay guys, let's all work in the same direction. This little girl is essential. Without that, it will never work. So what I'm actually advocating is refocus scientific advice from the recovery, where it's focused now, the long-term development, to protection, something you can do immediately. We need the international feedback. If no one tells Denmark to make an assessment, they will hang on doing nothing. And in the Baltic, there is one country that volunteered as coordinator for EU management. But since 2010, nothing has been done. You volunteer as coordinator and then you do nothing. And of course, the existing protection plans have their shortcomings. I won't deny that. So, summing up, just in time. Um, biology is broadly understood and yes there are knowledge gaps but they are far away we know enough to protect this species we have a history of over optimistic attempts to reproduce artificially to restock to develop the fishery but it was all over optimism we have a lot of impacts we have a centennial decline and a decadal decline in, in the youngest. And one day you have to accept the status as it is and focus on protection rather than analyzing why it declined. Definitely the challenge is that it is a very small scale, a scattered problem all over Europe. And you need to coordinate not only in the EU but also in the Baltic and even worldwide. But we have a an effective governance structure for that, distributed control, where you do it in a stepwise via national management plans. And currently the bottleneck essentially is we have a very uncommon problem, we have a very unconventional solution, and people are just conservative. And every step you see that people are slow in adapting the solution. And what happens at the bottom line is that we try to achieve something like this. Um, this is a dry deal. It's a New Zealand deal, <laughs> but it is a dry deal. And because the coordination is failing, we end up in a situation like this. And there I stop.
thank you very much, Willem, for an interesting talk and complex situation with the eel management. We have time for one short question before lunch. Any hands up? Okay. Yes. Ingrid. Ingrid. att bevara ålen i Europa. Alltså finns det en chans för ålens överlevnad om vi tittar fram till 2030? Um, I go back quite far. Yeah. 2009 the first protection measures were taken. And if I take a protection measure on a young eel and put that in place now, that young eel still has to grow and the average lifespan here in Sweden is 15 years. So taking your measures in 2009, that will affect something here, not the early years. But there have been countries that reduced the mortality on the mature eels leaving the continent. The fishery was reduced. Ireland closed its fishery, Sweden reduced its uh, east coast fishery. So there is a, a couple of mature eels leaving in 2009 already being affected. And it is just part of the total. Nevertheless, we see an unprecedented increase. And, okay, I'm now claiming that what we did here affected that. Okay, I can't really prove that, but at least it gives the impression. And what I'm saying is, we know that the many countries did not fulfill their promises. They installed some protection for the species, but not enough. And we have a good documentation of that. If you... If I try to... To, to get more money on my bank account, but I don't cut my expenses, I'm in trouble. And that's what's going on at the moment. People have done a bit, and already there was an effect. So what I advocate is fulfill your promises first. We agreed on a minimum protection level, and almost no country did that minimum. Go for that minimum first. And, um, well, what I hope is uh, taking measures here, having an effect there. We are now here. If you would take another step, I would not be surprised if it went up again. And then it's pr pretty close to a proof. But looking at my bank account and not cutting my expenses, how the hell do I expect it to go up? That's utopia. Cut my expenses. Cut the mortality on the EU all over Europe. Thank you very much, Willem. And you will also get some gifts. Thank you very okay. much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>